participate in my work at Google Ventures as a, as a hands-on person. So I help start up all the time with design and product management stuff. And see this works. It does. So I fail a lot. I've been failing a lot for a long time as a designer. Uh, you guys want to see some failures today? Yeah. 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 All right. That's Woo. good. That's good. You're awake. So. Um, Failure is something that's easy to talk about when you're older. I've also experienced a lot of failures early on in my career. I think the first chance I, I really got to have a taste of failure is on my first design project. This was back in the first bubble. Has anyone working in tech in the first bubble? OK, cool, my people. Uh, our company was trying to understand how people browse around the web. So what pages did people visit on a particular website? Where did they go next? That flow through a website, how could you visualize that? So I told my manager at the time, I said, I got this, I'm going to design a solution, just leave me alone. And I grabbed a desk and I started sketching. And every time someone came over to say, like, hey, what are you working on over there? I said, it's not done yet, leave me alone. So I kept working, I kept designing, made some beautiful mock-ups, I wrote code. This all took about three months, about the end of my internship. So at the end of the three months, I brought in everyone in, into a conference room, everyone in the company that I worked with, and I showed them my masterpiece. Uh, if you're in the middle of here, you'll have to look at the edges, it looked like this. Come on. Yeah. So the pages were like these skyscrapers in the air. And the way people moved between pages were like airplanes going from city to city. And if you are confused by this, you're not alone. Everyone in the room was completely baffled by this particular design. It was three months that I had worked that was just completely thrown out the window. Complete failure. Complete failure. So I was surprised by this. Um, <laughs> I was a little bit surprised that I, I was failing, but more so I was surprised that this thing that had made so much sense to me didn't make sense to the people around me. This thing was like, I thought it was going to be genius and no one else in the room understood it. And it turns out that this mode of failure is so common in design, we actually have a word for it. And now I know that word. It's called design blindness. And what it means is that when an idea comes out of your head, of course that idea makes sense to your head, it came out of there but it might not make sense to other people. And, and as a new designer, I wanted to get over that as fast as possible. I wanted to not experience that same thing again. So what I came to realize, and I think a, a lot of designers come to realize this, is that the only way out of that is to get critique early and often in your process. That means you're not waiting three months and then talking to someone, you're getting feedback all along. That sounds easy, but it's really hard. Because when you're building something and you know it's not done yet, you can see all the places where you know it's going to fail. And the idea of showing that to someone else and having them point out all the things you know are wrong with it and have them poke holes in it, that feels horrible. So you have to do it anyways. And as a designer, you have to be very, very open to failure. Um, not just this kind of failure, I think all sorts of failures. Because if you are designing a digital product today of any complexity, you are going to run into failure a lot as a designer. And that failure can either destroy you, or it can be your friend. And so I'm going to talk about three stories today about times when we failed building products. And mostly, it's about my relationship to failure, how I've learned to work with it and not have it destroy me. Because it's good that it doesn't destroy me, because I certainly hit up against it a lot. So this first story actually starts uh, back before I was a uh, designer. I was on a moving apartments, and I opened up this box of books in there. And there's a C++ book in there. There's one on the Rational Unified Process. These are about the geekiest books you could possibly imagine. Has anyone read these books? My people, yes. So back in, back in uh, uh, undergrad, this is how I learned how engineering, right? I would read these books, and then go apply it, and feel much more confident. And then I'd read another book, and apply it, and feel much more confident. And when I started as a designer, I was working on the Gmail team. And this is what a typical design critique looked like. You can see me in the middle with a uh, very sad expression on my face. I don't think it was going very well. Those are product managers and engineers around me. If you look very closely, you can see a bottle of beer in my hand. So I know this must have been a particularly hard design review. I was not very good at this stuff. And what I tried to do is learn more about design. I picked up books, and I read it. And then I came back and did another critique. And I was just as bad as when I started. So I read another book, and then I went back, and I was just as bad. So I kept reading all of these books about design, hoping that I would get better, and not feeling like I was ever getting better. What I wanted was this Design for Dummies book that I was hoping would exist. That I could find this book, read it, and then be a good designer. And what I came to realize after doing it for a couple of years is that what I was really hoping for was a book like this. 
Piano for Dummies. And I was hoping that I could read this book and then go play at Carnegie Hall. And that's not how piano works, right? You can't, no one expects to read a book about piano and then actually go play. How do we, how do we play piano? How do we learn how to play piano? Yeah, we sit down at the keyboard and uh, we put up a sheet of music and then we fail. We call it piano fail. No, we call it piano practice. <laughs> like, I'm going to go, go after school today and work on my piano fail. But that's how I was thinking about design at the time. I was doing this work, I was reading about it as much as I could, and I was failing over and over again. And it took me a long time to realize that that wasn't failure, that was just practice. That design is a craft that you learn through practice. Um, here I am, actually, again, same thing, doing practice. But, uh, come on, there. Um, design is learning through doing. And I see a lot of young designers today who are very caught up in the work that they're doing. Uh, they see their work as them so much that when it fails, they feel defeated. They feel like I felt back then like I would never be a good designer. I'm just not good at this thing. So I get a lot of these questions about how to be a better designer and what kind of books can I read. And I used to suggest a bunch of books, but now what I suggest to people is that you just go out and dive into a project and find that piano teacher. Find that mentor that can walk through all the designs with you and help you become a better designer over time. That's the first story. Second story is about battleships, actually. So battleships are these big, complex things, and uh, one of my first projects was actually on another big, complex thing called Gmail. Hundreds of millions of users, big, complex product. And we were building this chat system in Gmail. And I know this seems like old hat today, right? Like Facebook has chat like this, all sorts of websites have these little chat things that pop up. But back then, no one had done chat on the web. No one had built a, a, a good way for people to do this. And so we were designing this the first time. And uh, everyone on the team, actually before I go into that, who here has played the game Whack-A-Mole? You know what that is? Yeah, it's this car carnival game where these little moles pop up and we whack them down. That's what we call these little windows. These are called chat moles because they felt like they kept popping up when you were having conversations and you whacked them back down. So I'm going to call them chat moles. So back then, uh, the chat mole looked something like this. The whole team was using this. And, use, and loving it. Right? The whole Gmail team, even parts of Google, were using this UI and was working really well. There's a couple of small differences between this and what you see in your Gmail account today. The bars on the bottom and not the top. But pretty much it's the same thing. Because we were all using it and loving it, we sort of felt like, mission accomplished. Woo! Launch it! Right? <laughs> but someone on our team, I can't quite remember who, urged us to go and show this to users. And so we're like, fine, I'm going to show it to users. So we got our lunch and sat in a room and showed these people uh, Gmail. And from this room, we, we, text, uh, we sent them chats. We said, like, hey, how's it going? And we got to see what it was like for them to receive the first chat they've ever received. Um, and this design, the one that we were so happy with, was a complete failure. Can anyone here guess what the failure was? What was that? Couldn't close it. No, they could actually figure out how to close it. That's a great guess, though. Anyone else? What was it? It had to be louder. Yes, how do you send it, exactly. So we, we send someone a message, they type in the answer, and then just kind of stare at it. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? So every other chat message uh, program at the time had a big send button, but our chat was living on top of your email, and we didn't want to have a send button every time. We figured we could train people to hit the enter button. Turned out that all of our engineers and all the people on our team, maybe we just asked someone else, how do you send this? So press the enter button, and we figured it out, but average people couldn't figure it out at all. So we figured, let's fix this, right? We're designers, we're smart, we're going to do this. Um, we built another chat mall, and it says something like this. I'm going to have to read it. Uh, type in the box below, then press the enter key to send your message. This is a can't-fail design. There's no way that this thing can fail, right? It tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. We show this to people. Guess what happens? Failure. Um, <laughs> anyone guess what, what, why this one failed? This is a bit harder. No one reads, I heard, actually. Uh, that's part of it, but anyone else? They didn't know who it was from. So I'll tell you what happened. Uh, we were in that room and we sent them a chat message and it popped up and they closed it right away. What was that? We sent them another message that pops up and they closed it right away. What is going on? So we say, um, what was that thing that popped up in the corner? And people are saying, oh, I hate these pop-up ads. <laughs> we had created a message that was so salient and so attention grabbing they thought we were spammers trying to get their attention. So that didn't work. And at this point, as a designer, you feel horrible, right? You've designed this thing and people can't use it, and you're like, ah, fix it. And you've designed something else and they can't use your fix. You feel horrible. Um, I have been in this position so many times. This is a project I'm on right now where I'm in this position, where we've designed something and shown it to people and it doesn't work. 
And this is a point where you feel like you just want to give up. Like, why did we show this to people in the first place? I could have been, I could have watched by now and it would have been fine. I like, could have been out there and never known that there was a problem with the product. It would have been fine. Um, where I think it really pays off is when you can listen to people, when you can see through their eyes about what's happening. So in this example, we push even harder. And if you notice today, uh, the channel looks something like this. This is kind of how it looked when we first launched. And it says, press enter to send your message. Shows up in gray text, 10 pixels high, I think. And it goes away after three times after you use it. Now, the difference between this design and the design that we saw at the beginning is very, very minor. In fact, I don't think that as a designer I could have told you one was going to be successful. I don't think pundits or journalists or anyone else could tell the difference between one design and the other. It's only through that contact with the customer that we were able to first see that we were failing, and through sheer repetition and experience that failure, realize that we can get to a much, much better place with the design. And that's the difference between a product that a little tech team can use and a product that hundreds of millions of people can figure out how to use. That's what failure is like. So, I bring this all up because I think oh, it works. Um, why is there so much failure? Right? We're good designers at this point, and we still keep making these failures over and over and over again. That's odd. I think there's so much failure in design because it's a little bit like battleships. Not like these battleships, but more like the game of battleship. Because in the game of battleship, no matter how good you are at it, you're going to keep making guesses and keep being wrong. And it's each of those guesses you learn a little bit of something about what the product should be and what the product shouldn't be. Because in the end, we build for people. We build these products for people that are out there in the real world. And over time, they're a moving target. Their needs change all the time, like the little ships on a battleship board from game to game. Just as one example of that, you know the iPhone, how you can pull down and, and let go and it refreshes the new mail, mail you have and the new tweets that you have? People expect that now. They expect that when they pull down, there's going to be something that happens. But just a couple years ago, that didn't exist. Apple didn't invent it. It was an app developer that first came up with that pattern. Even in just those couple years, you have a, a big change in expectations. So knowing everything I know about how to do chat, if I went to go build that again, I would have just as many failures. Because the things people need probably are not chat on the web. The things are probably like, chat on your phone, or how do I bring SMS and Facebook messages and all these things together. Those are the problems people are having today. People are moving target. And that means that design is really about dealing with this failure. There is no way out of it. You have to uh, have contact with it every single day and figure out how to deal with your mistakes. So that's what we do in design. The third story I want to talk about is sneakers. Now, I love running. I run all around San Francisco. I know it's good for me. This morning, when I looked out my window, it looked something like this. I'm sure you saw it too. It's cold, it's dreary, it's raining. And when you're in, when you're in your bed under the warm covers, the last thing you want to do is put on your sneakers and go running. And that's kind of how I feel about showing the designs that I've done to people either within the company, for critique, or outside of the company who are users. I know it's good for me. I know it helps me get to a better spot. But it's just so hard to do. It's like waking up in the morning and going for a run. So what I found as helpful is having a running buddy, both you know, for actual running, but also for design work. I'll give you an example of that. We're doing work with a, a startup called Custom Made. Custom Made is a really cool business. It connects uh, people who want stuff custom made with builders who can actually made it, make it. So if I have an idea for a table, uh, Custom Made helps me find a craftsman who can build that particular table at the right lengths and dimensions with the wood that I want and the right shape and deliver that table to me. It's an awesome service. So I'm sitting in our design studio and I'm sketching out some ideas for this, this stuff. And my colleague Jake comes up to me and says, hey, those are great, we should show those to people tomorrow. I'm thinking, Jake, you're crazy. Like, I am so far from being done, done with this design. I haven't done any visual design, I haven't done any copywriting, I don't think this thing is, is ready for prime time at all. And when I heard myself say that it's not done yet, I remember that very first design project that I had ever done. And I remembered how good it felt as an excuse then, and how much I really needed to listen to Jake at this point. So we schedule a user study in one day. This is one of the things we do a lot in, in our design studio. Before we even have the design done, we, we schedule the user study. It's kind of a forcing function to make sure that we, we don't uh, over polish a particular design. And so now what we have to do, I've got these rough sketches, and we have to put about two weeks of design work into just one day, which is, turns out is really hard. 
<laughs> we're working fast. We're uh, laid out all the sketches that we had and started building a keynote prototype. I'm sure you've seen this type of thing before. And we, ended, we ended up going so fast that I was worried that it would just be a big failure. Like, we would do this user study and it would be a big failure. We wouldn't learn anything from it. Complete waste of time. As it turned out, it was kind of a big failure. We did a lot of things in the user study, but one of the things that we did is we asked people, if you came to the site and knew exactly what you wanted to build, where would you click to go get that done? Lots of different states people could come to the website in, but if you knew exactly what kind of table you wanted, where would you click to get it done? And we showed them, uh, one of the pages we designed was this. So there's a button there that says, uh, start a custom project. It's big and yellow and on the left. And we thought this would work fine. We thought people would find that and click it. And it says exactly what we, we asked them to do in the task. We had 100 people click through this thing. And we saw that this is what happened. A lot of people clicked on that, product, on that button, but a lot of people clicked elsewhere. People clicking on images, people clicking on little hearts. In fact, if you look right above that button, there's some UI text that doesn't really do anything. People were clicking on that. That's not a good sign. So this design was a, was a big failure. And uh, luckily, Jake, my colleague, the one that pushes me to, to keep failing as quick as possible, also suggested that we test a couple different designs with people. So there was, on the right, you see the one that, that I just talked about. There was also one with that yellow button on the bottom and one with the yellow button on the top. And the one with the yellow button on the top is particularly precious to me because this is a design I tried to use many times in the past. I tried to put big action buttons in the upper right. It actually works great from a visual design perspective. It's kind of out of the way. Uh, but what I found over and over again in user studies is that people couldn't find this button. Even when we had uh, eye tracking, we could see that people uh, didn't even look at it. That when they looked at it, they figured out what it was, but oftentimes people couldn't find it. So for, for many years, if you, if you got a chance to talk to me and you had a button in the upper right-hand corner, I would tell you, don't put it there. That is a really bad spot for a button. Because I had all this experience with it. So I didn't think this was going to succeed at all. I told Jake it was dumb to test it and kind of forced me to. And I'm glad he did because this is what the results were like. Almost everyone clicked on that button and there was much less distraction with the other things on the page. And I bring up this story because even if you're good at design, even if you have all the experience in a particular small thing like button placement on, on conversion, you can be wrong so many times. So many times. So there's lots of little surprises in this type of work. It's not the big surprises that you get after working for three months on a particular project and you realize that you wasted all that time. They're little things that you maybe wasted a day or an hour on. And those small surprises, those are the ones that you really want to. That's about leaning into failure. Because with those little surprises, you can steer and adjust your product. You can make it better over time. So for me, this is about learning to fail fast. And having someone, for me, that's a running buddy that forces me to fail as quick as possible. So I think when you run away from failure as a designer, what happens is you get less and less feedback. And in that starvation for feedback, you have less and less data to make better decisions, and eventually you get incredibly frustrated. What I've learned to do is to lean into this type, these types of failures. Because when you lean in, as hard as that is, it makes the failure smaller. And it makes the time between when you don't know what you're doing smaller. And all of that means that you can get better data, make better product decisions, and eventually be a better designer. Thank you.